Welcome to Grafenstone's Winter Meet, our first virtual conference on sustainable building and healthy environments. Winter Meet is an event sponsored by Grafenstone in collaboration with Grafenstone partners and international experts. The construction industry is responsible for an important percentage of global CO2 emissions. Our mission is to promote advanced and eco-friendly alternatives for the design community and the built environment. Join us to discover the latest trends and the evolution on how we experience the places we live in. Today, architecture and construction are focused on environmental responsibility, sustainability, and all the conditions for imp to improve the quality of life, the lifeability of our environment, of our physical environment. The challenge of the climate change has added, after the COVID pandemic, the importance of health. And this is no longer an option. Good architecture has always taken into account sustainability criteria. Passive items in the design, like uh, natural ventilation or the correct sun orientation, and also the use of local materials. And this is especially clear in the Mediterranean traditional architecture. The challenge of climate change has introduced the importance of the measurement the certification and monitoring of all our projects. The arrival of international funds has also focused and put a special importance in those certifications in terms of energy efficiency, CO2 emissions, and these are very important for their investment decisions, and not only in housing projects, but both in offices or uh, facilities. For the final clients, there is a growing awareness of what this investment means in terms of comfort, savings, and, of, and a part, of course, of the social responsibility. But professionals and companies, we need the support of the public institutions in order to diffuse the best practices in terms of energy efficiency and reduction of uh, CO2 emissions, in terms of comfort, lifeability, to improve the life, the quality of life. And of course, very important for the return of investment. COVID has accelerated and health is now a key element. Architecture has its access in people and the improvement of the quality of life. So it has always been a determining factor of design, which can now rely on an industry that works in research and innovation to improve the products with that objective. The history of architecture shows the importance of lime-based materials, warranty of health and fight against epidemics. But this has the disadvantage of their volatility and also the need of constant maintenance. Graphene technology has solved this disadvantage and uh, makes lime really a revolutionary material. We met Grafenstone in a building renovation in the historic center of Madrid, where urban regulation obliged to use lime-based uh, plaster and motors. Grafenstone was the best uh, solution in terms of uh, technology and uh, maintenance and economy. Now, we use Grafenstone in all our projects, outdoor and indoor projects, and not only in renovation. But let me tell you, Grafenstone will be key in the new sector that will come uh, as a consequence of the next generation funds in terms of urban renovation and urban regeneration, and very special because of uh, 
all what is related with energy efficiency, decarbonization, and renaturation. For sure, I, we think Grafenstone will be key in this new sector in the real estate and building industry in Spain. I think a lot of paint companies out there do claim to be very low VOC, but often they don't really explain what's in the paint. Um, and so I think that's where Graffenstone is different. I think with my experience, I'm trying to be as transparent without, you know, without um, without trying to compromise the brand. I'm trying to be transparent about what our product is so that people understand there are alternatives out there there are healthy alternatives and, um, you know, we need to change the way we paint, especially with the acrylics that are out there at the moment. Well, I think you already are offering what the what people want, and that is just to be natural and true to the, the product itself. So, you know, the mineral matte finish is very on trend now. People are looking to, they, they, they're moving away from that plastic sheen finish. They don't need glosses anymore. It's going back to basics. It's going back to, you know, the, the, where the earth began in a way, it's back to, you know, uh, natural products that are doing what they should do to the environment. Um, and so there is a, a more of a shift in that trend as far as um, the look and feel of the product. Um, and I, I, when I am talking to designers and, and architects, I do explain that, you know, there is a place still for acrylic paints, but, you know, we are having to move towards more natural products. And so you know, matte finish is the way to go for that particular look. And then texture is also a really big tre trend. So like with your earth collection, that is very that, a growing trend for renders now and for a more um, earthy look. I think people are trying to not make it too um, glossy anymore, the, the design industry. Um, so I think, yeah, I think, and also they still want to have durable products, which I think Graffinstone really does well with the with the graphene technology that we use in the product that stands out from the rest. Well, at the moment, we've got um, a, quite a few small high residential, high end residential projects underway. Um, a lot of the sort of boutique designers have really taken to this product um, and they are using it for some very beautiful high end residential projects. Um, we've also got a a big project with the big picture festival in our local community for next year which is a big mural festival and that will um, start in in um, the local Melbourne area and then it will move towards South Australia uh, and Sydney um, following this particular event in March so that's a really big um, that's a really big proposal and partnership that we've set up um, so that's really exciting and then we've got um, in WA we have a few university projects and a hospital in South Australia um, so there's a lot of um, there's definitely a drive towards the hospital and the use of the healthy products in hospitals and then we've got uh, Montreal Common Commons in WA which is a big multi-res um, project which will which will be later next year that it'll start um, so, and we're just working with lots of small builders at the moment to try and get the to get the message across of how to use this product um, and starting to train them now that we can do face to face we are starting to you know meet builders and applicators and teach them it's all about educating the client um, and even though that we have got a long way to go I really do feel that it's going to be a great success uh, Ecotev is a supporting company for private builders, architects, developers, investors, whatever, uh, companies, and we advise them basically how to build with the bio-organic materials. We are also a wholesale company that supply these materials uh, to our partners. Basically, we are working on, as a company specialized in uh, breeding house building, so with an open structure. So we need to be very careful that we don't uh, close the house so that the breathing structure of the house is not uh, working anymore. It's very important to us. Well, all projects we are involved in, we want to work with the top quality products and that fits in our company profile and that are companies that we want to go all the way.
to achieve the goal. And we believe that Graphington can certainly is one of the, let's say, the, the quality partners that we like to work with. The biggest problem is to go against the habit of all the people today and to change the methods they are working with today. But on the other hand, more and more people, and especially architects, get more and more enthusiastic in what we are doing and our approach and the need of these changes. So the words you're busy with the future, we use, we, we hear almost constantly, but the future was yesterday. We, we did it already a long time. Uh, and ancient ages from the Romans or the, the Chinese build also with breathing materials. They knew that houses need to be healthy inside. So we didn't invent something new, but we made a, an old technique in a new jacket. Well, thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here. I'm really happy to be able to share a little bit about what has been the evolution of, of our work and also of sustainable construction in, in Latin America and in Colombia. Um, I think your question really uh, helps me to exemplify and, and reflect what has happened in our country and in our region with this topic. I think when we started with the Colombia Green Building Council, uh, really it was a big struggle to, to try to create a ne network of companies that really believed in this. It was really something that was very specific to um, a, a small group of companies, you know, and to international investors and to some specific producers and providers of materials. And, and uh, people really felt that it was something that mm, they could do and should do if they wanted to, to make it a part of their value proposition, but not something that was part of the market at that time. You know, when we started in 2008, there were, I, I think, around eight registered projects in LEED certification, which is, it, it's a way to understand kind of the, the how, how new the market was. Today, we have in Colombia more than uh, 700 projects that are registered in, in different types of certifications, which also shows how the, the market has uh, matured. So we have LEED, but we have Casa Colombia, which is a housing certification specifically for our market, and we have edge and, and well and, well, you know, many different options and, and just for lead, uh, more than 400 projects. So, um, so this was a challenge, just making people understand how important it was and, and that it was a good uh, business decision to, to do these types of investments. Throughout the years, uh, the kind of the economic fluctuations and crises we have had over the years have also been a big challenge. And I think what we are living right now is, is an example of that uh, because uh, people question um, every investment and you know that sustainability usually is a long-term or medium-term return, has a medium-term return on investment. So it's harder to make people uh, make decisions when they don't have a short-term um, return. And I would mention as a challenge also kind of the, the difficulty it is to, to make so many different actors work together. And I think that's a challenge for sustainability in any sector, but in our sector, which has such a diverse value chain, to be able to kind of make these different actors um, speak to each other and collaborate and be able to innovate in an integrated way has been and will be, I think, a challenge for us. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, we we are very um, happy that right now things and the market and the context internationally and, and in our region has changed so much that these things will become easier, I think, over the next couple of years. Yeah, well, we have been very lucky. I think Colombia has one of the of, a very robust a public policy um kind of umbrella for sustainable construction. You know, we, we do have a country that has obviously committed to, to uh, the Paris Agreement and also to the Sustainable Development Goals. And this has created some specific metrics and goals for the country that, that have been um, kind of distributed to the different sectors. And over the years, and especially in the last few years, the construction sector has kind of become more of a, has more of a leading role in, in meeting these kind of objectives. 
Uh, so what the country has done to be able to help the, the sector to meet these goals is create, we have right now a tax incentives that apply to construction projects that were created specifically for energy efficiency and for renewable energy, but that the projects can benefit from those. So I think that has been a, one important a push for the market and a really important message, you know, that 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 the government is interested in incentivizing these kinds of of decisions. We also have, for example, the Circular Economy National Strategy, which it speaks about the government promoting certificate sustainable construction certifications uh, for our sector. No, they haven't created specific incentives for that, but it, this shows kind of a message of where their interest is. Mm. And uh, we do have regulations that push for energy efficiency and water efficiency nationally. Uh, this right now are not linked to specific incentives, but uh, it's, it has been an important message to the sector that uh, they have to start making decisions and design and construction decisions that are aligned to these regulations. What we have right now, for example, is that this national um, regulation for energy and water efficiency is being used locally so that local governments are, are thinking about designing incentives for people that go beyond these uh, savings. So I think it is something that is, is going to start to change and grow over the years. It's something that we did a recent study of the, the state of sustainable construction in the country and, and um, companies in all our value, value chain said it was one of the most important barriers they, they, they find that we need more incentives from the government. So we as the Colombia GBC are definitely working on helping the government create a greater incentives and also incentives that respond more directly to kind of the characteristics of the projects because what we have right now sometimes it's very difficult for people to to access um those those tax incentives so i think we have a long way to go but i think we will start seeing important changes in in the next few years and and just to mention we also have incentives from the commercial banks and from state banks also which i i think is a good um, addition to to the incentives uh, from the government, and this has been growing over the last year and a half. We we have doubled the number of banks in the country uh, that offer benefits for um, uh, the loans for the projects. So so yeah, I think it 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 will be an important aspect of of making this market grow. Well, I definitely think this context is challenging their strategic. Uh, kind of decisions around sustainability. I think that that is one thing that we are seeing in in companies of all sizes of our sector. They're they're knocking our door our door and saying, I don't really know where to start, you know, and and how how to integrate sustainability in 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 the strategy, which is something we have talked about for so long, but now companies are really seeing that it's a, it's something that they need to do or or, or they'll be behind. You know, so I think that is important. I think something that that is going to be a challenge for our sector in our whole region is a um, kind of risking to do things different and and creating different business models and kind of um, analyzing cost in a different way. You know, in a long term uh, with a long term view, uh, because we have a sector that has done things the same for so long, the same types of buildings, the same kind of funding and business models and and it's something that needs to change for sustainability not to be considered a cost and to be able to to bring those benefits to the users and to their employees and to the companies so i think that and also that's going to be linked to to capacity building i think companies are are starting to understand that they need their employees to be um, fluent in a different language and and to have a knowledge of you know materials of um of of things they 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 didn't have to know until um, a couple of years ago so i think that's going to be one of the the biggest things because i think the context is giving them uh, all the the tools that they need and and they have to be ready and open uh, to use that in a very innovative way and and i think what is very positive is that 
um, they're understanding that there's there's no way back. You know, <laughs> this is kind of the way. It's not a way to differentiate in the market. It's just the way the market is going to work. Uh, maybe in a few decades, but we're getting there. Well, based on talking about the perception on on sustainable products and materials, I think, um, and it's something really interesting. We did this same study I, I talked about, about the, the, the current state of sustainable construction in Colombia. We did a survey on final users and we asked them, what is the, the characteristic that you most identify with sustainable construction for buildings? And we had energy efficiency, water efficiency, you know, in many different aspects and and most users identify uh, the use of sustainable materials as the most important aspect uh, that they relate to sustainable construction so i think there's a big opportunity uh, for us to really uh, prioritize in the view of the final user the importance of sustainable materials um i do think and especially for developers that we still have a long way to go um there's kind of a view of that there's very few um, and offer very few materials and their cost is too high you know so it's like a, a a negative circle that there's not enough demand but they feel like they don't have enough supply and and we we'll, really need to 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 start working on that from the GBC, the Colombia GBC, where we're working, on, for example, on a guide that helps uh, manufacturers, but also developers to understand uh, how broad a sustainable material, kind of the different aspects that can make up a sustainable material and what they need to understand to make a decision and to also kind of give value to the investments the manufacturers have had. So so definitely it's something that we, we think can be a, an important mobilizer for the industry in, in the next um, few years. We definitely need to work more on making the final user and the bigger market be aware of LEED and its benefits. We have a very different, I think this happens in, in, in most countries in our region, uh, kind of the market um, very centered on our big, on our bigger cities. And I think we have um, a challenge to make this known to developers and users all over the country and also to make people understand the benefits of lead, not just on efficiency, but right now we're talking a lot about health and safety, which I know is very important uh, from your products that I think is something we really need uh, to work on. We are having a growth lead is definitely um, one of the aspects that has uh, led uh, the development or, of the market in of sustainable construction market in in our country and i think it would continue to do so and not just lead but also kind of um push it to bigger challenges and changes you know i i was talking about urban development we're seeing in colombia that we're having the first certified uh, projects for uh, lead for cities and communities for example and we we are seeing that this it might grow. We're seeing uh, an important use of ARC, which is an, an, um, a platform for uh, measuring um, the performance of the buildings. Um, so we really see it, it, it has a very important opportunity to continue to, to show the market what the excellence in, in our standard is. Hi, I'm Doug Terry. I'm the president of Doug Terry Homes here in St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada. <clears throat> We're a net zero builder. Uh, we've actually built more net zero ready homes than any builder in Canada. Uh, we're very much involved with the sustainability movement in Canadian home building. And uh, we're also very proud to be principal distributor for Graffenstone in Canada to help bring the, the Graffenstone brand to uh, Canadian home builders and consumers. So a net zero home is one that creates as much energy as what it uses over the, the course of a year. 
it doesn't really matter which fuel source you're using. It's looking at the total gigajoules of energy that's consumed by the home. And then a, a, an actual full net zero home would have the ability to create that much energy through either solar or wind, principally solar. So we build net zero ready homes and net zero homes. So not all of our homes have solar panels, but some of them do. They're all capable of having the solar panels required. Uh, so net zero homes would be, if you will, the ultimate benchmark for energy efficiency of where homes need to go. Um, I think the consumers are getting more interested in it, not only because of energy efficiency and the cost of fuels are rising, but also because some of the other points that are highly important to what a net zero home represents, specifically around indoor air quality and occupant comfort. Those are two really important principles. In fact, we actually, in our company, we look at uh, what I call the four principles of, of modern design, which is a carbon reduction strategy, indoor air quality, occupant comfort, and then climate resilient uh, construction as well. So we, we think that the consumer is really gravitating towards net zero because of occupant comfort and in, in indoor air quality. People are spending more and more time at home because of COVID. And so the, the occupant space where they're gonna be spending time now for home offices, for doing schooling, for doing hanging out, you know, being, if you will, sequestered into the home means that indoor air quality, what they're breathing on a daily basis, it, it concerns about pathogens and the fear of what might happen with what they're breathing has really risen in people's minds as a priority. They want to know that their home is their sanctuary and it's safe. They they think it is, but with the Net Zero brand, they know they're buying something that that, that has been built into the, the design and construction of the home. It's highly important to the consumers that are choosing this as a product. To develop net zero, but not not necessarily net zero from what the standard normal method of net zero is, that's typically looking at just uh, energy consumption. And I've, I believe so strongly that it's not necessarily the right answer, that we're moving beyond that as a company to the point that I'm almost finished my book that's from bleeding edge to leading edge, a builder's guide to net zero homes. In the book, we talk about what I think are the two fundamentals that every builder's got to get right. The first is water management plan. What's your strategy for making sure you get water away from the building? And the second one is what's your air tightness plan? How to make the building tighter? Because we want to control how fresh air gets in and out of the home on a regular basis. From that, we look at what I call the four principles of modern design. I just mentioned them before, uh, indoor air quality, occupant comfort, climate resilient construction, and carbon reduction strategies. What I really love about the Graffenstone products is it helps us very strongly with two of those. One being if you're using, say, the Ecosphere paint, helping with your carbon reduction strategy. And the other one is the indoor air quality piece. In North America, there are far, far more chemicals than what are in European products. And we're, we're very cognizant of that. It's very minor within the marketplace in North America right now. And we feel like we're salmon swimming upstream talking about it because most people aren't aware of it, but they're slowly coming around. And it's typically people that have health issues that are realizing there's a difference in the products. So with the Graffenstone, one of the things that we really promote there's no MI, which is a really bad chemical for causing allergen reactions that can be extremely severe. And there's also no formaldehyde. So we greatly appreciate that because the other products on the market that are similar do have those in them. It's a definite distinguisher in the marketplace. So we think that indoor air quality is probably one of the number one ways that Graffenstone can distinguish itself globally from other products because of the lack of those uh, uh, chemicals that can cause allergen reactions. When you're looking at a net zero home, I think it's important that we consider what that means. And it means that the home is significantly tighter than a code built home. So that's great from an energy standpoint. It also means that we have to be very careful about introducing fresh air into the home. However, it also means we've got to be very careful about what we put into our home, especially what we put on our walls. The concern we have in North America is with the, the paints and other products that are off-gassing a lot of chemicals. Even if it's a considered a zero VOC product here in North America, it has a higher level of chemicals in it than what has in, in say, Europe. So we like the Graffenstone brand because it doesn't have MI, which is a very uh, significant chemical for, chemical for causing allergen reactions. It also doesn't have formaldehyde. Either one of these is a preservative, can cause allergic reactions in people. And with a super tight home, this becomes even more of an issue, even more prevalence 
uh, with consumers having having the reactions for that. So by that reason, I really like the Graph and Stone brand for what it does for our customers, for giving them a safer living environment. The other big piece is we're looking at carbon reduction. Uh, there's no point in, in looking at building a net zero home that actually can't save as much carbon in it as what you've put in it to build a net zero home. So we're looking at reducing our carbon footprint for what we're putting into the home, not just what is on the operational carbon reduction. <clears throat> That's why we like the Graph and Stone Ecosphere product line, because when we use that, we know we're helping to offset the carbon footprint of the manufacturing process that means we're reducing our total carbon footprint and we find that that's important for what we want to do moving forward it's so important that actually we're helping to guide industry towards a lower carbon footprint overall here in canada and and in fact in north america the four principles are extremely important because what that does is it leads us to what we consider uh the ultimate goal of housing which is a sustainability element that we're calling life arc and life arc is what happens if we have what happened in texas last winter where they got knocked offline for a week and had no energy okay so we're very concerned that that could happen at any time either heating or cooling so life arc is about not only not losing the building to the landfill because you've got water damage or what have you it's also about, about keeping the occupants safe right so you have to look at a whole bunch of different features that's why we think the four principles are so important because they're the fundamental principles that you need to have in order to be able to build uh, to the life art concept that we're developing. One of the things that we're seeing change within our marketplace is we've got an affordability crisis happening. There's a lack of housing available, even though Canada is the second largest landmass in the world. So the concern that we have is we've got to be able to provide additional types of housing, even in small towns like mine, we have to be able to provide say apartment units like this so this is a small 16 unit building it's part of a, a two building project a total of about 60 units but we also want to make sure that we're providing space that's not only inviting but considers indoor air quality so for example we're using the veneta uh, to create a, a marble effect backsplash in our kitchen cabinetry uh, we've done two different variations of light and the dark depending on what it is and also we want to look at providing something in the hallway to really distinguish the entry features without adding a lot of cost. So we use the Modena effect uh, uh, to create this treatment around the doorway. It's very modern looking, very clean, uh, but it has a real warm texture to it. So this is uh, something that we're really proud of to have featured the two different graph and stone products besides the paint into this. It's helping to reduce our carbon footprint. It doesn't add the MI or formaldehyde that we were concerned about. And it makes for a really nice looking space for our for our tenants to have. So we think that that's important. Another critical piece so that we're looking at is is taking the overall um, site and making sure that it, there's interconnectivity for not just the humans involved but also flora and fauna and the ability for animals to migrate uh, we have a saying at Doug Terry Homes that at Doug Terry Homes we don't just build for humans so we do consider things like when we're having walking trails within our communities we want to make sure that there's lots of area where we're providing space that's not just grass that's going to get mown but that's naturalized so it's helping to have a space for the pollinators because we need to have pollinators in order for our overall plant life to survive which is the survival of our species as well so it's highly important that we look at products that are intermingling or following that and that's one of the reasons why i like the graph and stone my home is a tree uh, marketing brand because it really lines up with our theory about doing microforest and pollinator plantings so we're very happy to have the Graph and Stone brand because of what it does to match with what we're doing here on our overall communities as well. And the reason for that was clearly because Graph and Stone had a, a concept and a product range which was very unique and I could see a commercial opp opportunity there. So it was then obviously a question of um, uh, getting all of the research in place, getting all the documentation sorted out, getting creating, starting the creation of a good team, most importantly, that knew about paints, and then uh, beginning the, the long process of educating the marketplace about our uni you know, unique selling points and also 
Graffenstone's very unique brand values. Um, so, you know, the feedback we have is generally speaking extremely good. The, quali the quality of the products that, that uh, Graffenstone produce are excellent. Um, where we do get issues, it's typically because the contractor has not read the instructions. They don't remember to perhaps to dilute, because obviously to keep our carbon footprint low, we ship less water around the planet. So they're usually basic things like that. Uh, it's almost never an issue about the, the manufacturing or the quality of the product. So we get a lot of really good testimonials from clients. So, uh, you know, all in all, a very happy picture there. I think we have barely scratched the surface. As you say, the UK is a very saturated, very developed market with a huge range of brands and an even huger range of colors, of course. Uh, so I personally try not to get too concerned about what other people are doing. And I just keep my head down and stay focused on all of the qualities of, of the Graffenstone range. And so in terms of potential, I think it's only we're going to go in one direction, and that's north. And it's a three billion pound market over here. So uh, we've barely scratched the surface. Huge, uh, huge opportunities to to uh, to to to, to a grab. Um, so so you know, in terms of awareness, people are beginning to switch and become much more knowledgeable and care more about sustainability, ecology. Uh, the impact of the paints industry generally, which is very damaging uh, ecologically and also in terms of people's health uh, in in respect to indoor air quality with all the release of VOCs and so on. So I think that's the education process is clearly happening because of all the terrible stuff we read in the press every day about what's happening around the, the planet. You know, we're either, we're either burning to death or, or drowning. And so uh, this is going to go in one direction. I think there's uh, a, a, an enormous amount uh, of opportunity. And I also think that um, it, from a statutory point of view, I think the laws are going to move increasingly in our favour, where the larger projects are, go are going to become more forced to respect the use of more sustainable materials. So all in all, we're in the right place. We do projects of all types. You know, We'll do people's front doors and back rooms, all the way up to all of Facebook's offices around the UK. We've, we've uh, recently started, I don't know, the fourth or fifth office for them with others to come. We've done their HQ. We're about to do a huge mural uh, in their HQ, multi-floor mural with a, a, a mural artist who's become very well known in the UK called Yinka Ilori. He also did the backdrop for the Brit Awards in the UK, which is a massively uh, uh, viewed event every year. Uh, we did a lovely project at Cambridge University, heritage project with this beautiful cantilevered spiral staircase. We've also done uh, Birmingham uh, Oratory House, the Cardinal Newman's Library, which is a fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, heritage project. We've done Brewdog Hotel and Restaurant recently up near Manchester again. This is a, a global craft beer brand. Uh, again, in the last couple of months, we've won two new accounts. One that is a huge US-based uh, property management company. They're on about $32 billion worth of property. Uh, a lot of student accommodation. So in the summer break, they, they, they geared up four or five contractors who bought a lot of product from us for the summer break in order to, to redecorate some student accommodation. And last week, we've won uh, Grosvenor Estates, which is, as you might know, uh, Lord Grosvenor has a massive uh, uh, property portfolio across the world, in particular in London. And uh, so, so we started with them, and I know they have plans to roll that out uh, more widely. So a real range of projects and uh, many, many, many more opportunities to come uh, once we can educate and inform people about this opportunity. Yeah, and indeed, it's impressive. And indeed, as you mentioned, it, it reflects the versatility of the products that we have. Um, well, huge success uh, you've been experiencing and more is to come. Uh, this is also reflected in, in the increase of brand visibility um, that you're having in the UK. 
also recognition such as the eco-friendly, uh, the best eco-friendly decorating brand award from Marie Claire in in the UK. <laughs> Sustainability. There it is. I have it on my desk. It's a really nice little uh, uh, prize, actually, you know, from a very, very well-known uh, 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 publishing house. So, so yeah. it was a good award to win, and we have another super uh, opportunity coming up. Uh, maybe, maybe that's your question, Clara. Um, so, vegan interior design or vegan design in general, it's just like vegan food and clothing. Um, it does not contain any products that are derived or um, made of animals. So that means um, it's typical interior design products like or materials like leather, wool, silk, fur, and feathers and down, you will not find in a vegan design project. But then there's also, it, it goes into more detail when it comes to wall paints, for example, they, the typical commercial wall paints, they often contain either animal products or they contain chemicals that have been tested on animals. Um, so we would not include these in a vegan project either. And then there's a lot of animal products hiding in a lot of home products. And in vegan design, we try to exclude them and replace them with plant-based or bio-based alternatives. Just like the vegan food movement has developed over the last decade and it accelerated and has become more prominent because people realize what's in their food. I think it, you know, we're catching up on the whole food and clothing movement, but it, it comes from the same kind of consciousness that people have and people are becoming a bit more aware what they use and what's in the products that they buy. It is a bit slower than, again, slower than the food and the clothing movement. They're already a little bit further advanced, but um, we do see a lot of bio-based materials, um, whether that's cactus leather or citrus silk or healthier wall paints, um, bio-derived construction elements, um, there's, for example, there's tiles or even insulation materials made from mushroom, from mycelium. So it's all, I feel like we're in the middle of, or we're at the beginning of a big revolution of that whole um, industry. There's a lot of companies producing these um, materials, but there's still small amounts and it's not really for the mass market yet because the demand isn't there but um, I've seen it accelerating over the last few years already and there's more products um, coming to the market and there's more demand for them so I really see yeah there is an evolution um, happening right now. Um, yep the main thing I noticed was the the low level of smell or like there wasn't really any smell you know usually when you paint a room or you paint any product you always have that smell that sticks around for a while so that really um I really noticed that you don't have that it, you paint something like I painted a few walls just to test the the paint and you don't have that smell and um what I also found it was really easy to handle I like usually you have that sticky paint and you wash the brushes forever and, and it doesn't come off and it's really sticky and when you you know it gets on the ground it, it's sticky my phone is really easy to to clean I mean that might it's a practical thing but um I find for like for a big job that would really make a big difference whether it's a DIY job or or you get a painter to to paint um and then the finish, I found the finish very, um, very different from, from other paints. I mean, in a way, you know, the painting was the same, same feeling. It, it, it's, it's the same. It's a paint. It's easy to put on the wall. But um, the finish was really, really matte and really flat and very, I, I feel like you can tell it's, it's very natural. Like, even though you paint it like any normal paint, which, 
might have a whole lot of plastic in it, you can you can tell that it's it's more natural and it it, it just it feels healthier. I can't really explain it, but it it just feels feels good. I'm always looking in Australia where I'm based, but I'm also looking all over the world what what finishes are out there. And obviously paint is one of the major interior design items that any client always needs. And in Australia, the market was very limited with vegan paints. So I kept Googling and, and I wasn't aware that Graffenstone was everywhere in the world. I always thought it's it's a European product and you know shipping it to Australia would be complicated. And um, that's why I never really specified it for a project. But then, um, so yeah, when I found out that you can get Graffenstone anywhere in the world, there was uh, another um, big discovery because we, we've got some vegan paints in Australia, but um, it's not it's not as natural. It's not um, it's it's vegan, but it doesn't mean it's not still full of a lot of plastics. So um, that was a really great find, and I'm always looking for the lowest um, VOCs possible and the fact that your paint is um, so breathable as well, that really um, opened a whole new world for me. So um, yeah, I was very glad to discover that we can get it anywhere in the world and then I can specify it for clients anywhere. Mm -hmm.